thank you so much for joining me again on Verse. So last night I saw my mom watching Grey's Anatomy. Well really, I was watching it too. It's this hospital show where there are tons of emergencies. Partly it's interesting because you see how the doctors feel when they're learning to do surgeries for the first time. And partly it's interesting because you see gross stuff you wouldn't normally see in real life. Emergencies that hurt people are called traumas, and the doctors that operate on the injured people are called trauma surgeons. Watching this show made me wonder, how do you learn to be calm when you're looking inside a person's body and everything is bleeding and broken? Is there a kind of person who was born to do this, or can you learn to be calm enough? I decided to ask Dr. Alex Mihalovich, a trauma surgeon in Victoria, BC. Thank you so very much for being here. It must be an amazing feeling when you save someone's life. But if someone's in an accident and their body is badly hurt, how do you know where to find all the parts when you cut them open? Well, usually when somebody's hurt, uh, we, can t we know from their vital signs, so their heart rate and their blood pressure, that they're very sick or that something's bleeding. And where they're bleeding, we get signs from what type of accident, the bruises on their skin, and, and really if we feel their belly and it's it's hard and distended, or if they can't breathe properly, we know it's in their chest. So we get all sorts of signs telling us what part of the body has been injured, and then we just target that and we see when we get inside. Okay. Well, I think I'd be scared to cut someone open. When did you know you wanted to do this, and how did you even know you could handle it? I know my parents said that when I was five years old, I announced I was going to be a doctor. And then on my first day of medical school, a pediatric surgeon or a surgeon that operates on, on babies invited me to come into the operating room and um, it was a small surgery, just a hernia surgery and immediately when I saw him pick up the knife and he was about to cut the baby's skin I thought, oh my goodness, he can't cut the baby and then he cut and everything went so smoothly and the baby did so well afterwards and that day I think I decided I wanted to be a surgeon. That's really cool. When you're not on the job, what do you do for fun? Do you do exciting things or do you go very quiet? Um, I do a lot of sports and most of them are pretty risky, which I don't necessarily advocate as a surgeon, but I, um, my husband and I kiteboard and uh, we whitewater kayak. And then living in Victoria, we love to mountain bike and I also work as a ski patrol in Whistler. Well, that's really cool. I do a lot of snowboarding. Do you have to be born calm or can you learn to be calm in a job like yours where you have to make instant decisions? So I have friends that we all started medical school at the same time and as each of us was exposed to different disciplines you realized without actually knowing it before what you were going to be good at and so for me I loved the excitement of the operating room, I loved the trauma bay, I, I got so exhilarated from being in that environment where I have other friends who unknown to them when they saw blood for the first time they almost passed out and they went into psychiatry. What's the most unusual surgery you've ever had to fix? Probably the strangest one was I had a 12-year-old boy who ate 14 bags of gummy bears and they formed into a giant rainbow ball that blocked his bowel completely. Wow. And so uh, I had to operate on him and I pulled out this giant congealed rainbow ball of gummy bears. <laughs> <laughs> so that, was funny. that was probably the strangest. Has there ever been a patient that's made you laugh? There was a patient that kept coming back to the emergency department because unfortunately she had uh, a mental illness, but she really loved getting the attention of the doctor. So she'd find any way to keep coming back in. And what she used to do was eat different metal objects. So she'd eat knives and forks. It was important that we didn't give her the attention she wanted so that she'd keep coming back. And so often we would, because the forks don't really cause any problem if they just sit there or they pass through you. And you know, it's really, if they caused a problem, we would obviously help her. And so there was one resident or a student I was working with and he had never seen this patient, but I knew her well. And I looked at the x-ray and there was knives and forks in her stomach. And so I asked him to go in and see her. And uh, so he went in and he took half an hour and he got her whole history. And when he came out, he said, oh, wait a minute, I forgot my pen. And I went, oh, and he went back in and she'd eaten his pen. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, and so he learned the hard way. What's the most extreme procedure that you do? Well, if somebody is shot or stabbed in the chest and they lose their vital signs right in front of us, meaning that their heart suddenly stops or their blood pressure suddenly plummets, uh, then we do something called an emergency thoracotomy. Basically, you just pick up a knife and cut them right across the chest, open up the chest, and stick your hand in the hole 
that's bleeding in the heart or the aorta or wherever it is. So then you have to actually jump on top of them, stick your finger in the heart, pump the heart with your hands, and wheel down to the operating room to try to stop it. Oh, wow. So I've done that about 70 times, which can uh, really get your blood pressure raised. So what's the most common injury that you have to do surgery on? It depends really where you are. So here in Victoria, it tends to be car accidents. Uh, when I worked in Cape Town, South Africa, it was gunshot wounds. And I also worked in northern Uganda where we, it tended to be a lot of landmines or um, different kind of bombs that had been left in fields. So really, being a trauma surgeon is interesting because the patients you see is really reflective of the society you're working in. Could you show me something that I could do if I ever saw an accident? Sure. It's really important that if somebody is in an accident and you're at the scene and before, help, before the paramedics get there is to keep their neck steady so that because your spinal cord is very fat at the top and then very skinny at the bottom, but your bones are the opposite. They're very, your vertebrae are very thick at the bottom and very skinny at the top. So the top you have these skinny little bones but this big chunk of nerves. And so if it's broken and you move the neck, that bone can stab into the spinal cord and cause damage. So yeah, I can show you how to do that. Okay, that sounds great. So when you're stabilizing someone's neck, what's an important thing to look out for? Well, the first thing you want to notice is if they're awake or if they're not. Okay. So if they are awake, you can ask them if they're having any neck pain. And if they say they're not, then you usually don't have to worry about it. Um, and then obviously if they say that they've got they can't feel anything in their legs or they can't feel their arms or they have tingling, then you want to be really careful to make sure you stabilize the neck because that means that the spinal cord's been injured somehow, okay? Um, if they're uh, not awake or unconscious, then you just always have to assume that they have broken their neck and just make that assumption. So Alice has pretended that she's fallen from a car from a bicycle. And so the first thing that we would do in this case, because she's on her back, her head's turned, but we just really gently bring it slightly forward. And then basically your spinal cord runs from the level of your nose, but deep inside your head, and then all the way down to your bum. But this is the level that we're really worried about in the neck. So what you want to do is squeeze her ears between your arms, Put your hands around her collarbones and then hook your thumbs under her collarbones. Because now you've got this really secure position where she can't, like if she moves, if I move, I'm moving her neck and her head and her chest as one unit. And that's what you want to be sure to do. The best thing to do is not move her at all. But if you have to move her out of the road because there's other cars coming or the car's on fire or she's in a dangerous position, then the person stabilizing the neck does this. Two or three other people grab the rest of her body, all holding in a straight line. And then the person at the head would say one, two, three, and lift her as one unit. Okay. Okay? So do you want to try to do that? Sure. Okay. First, really carefully bring her head, okay. barely moving it, but just so that you can get your other arm under there. So now put, yeah, her wrist or her ears between your wrists. Okay. And you're going to squeeze harder than you, than you think. You're actually going to want to squeeze your head, and if she's unconscious, she can't feel it, so that's yeah. okay. And then have your hands just as you have them. Okay. And then, yep, yeah, and hook your thumbs just under her collarbones. It's a nice little, little ledge to go under. Okay. There, and then make sure you're really squeezing your head. And then if you had two or three other people, you'd be the guy saying, okay, okay. let's move her one, two, on three. On three, one, two, three, and then, then, okay. okay. Well done. Thank you. So now that I know more about what trauma surgeons do, I'm super grateful for heroes like Alex. I'm pretty sure being a trauma surgeon would be a great adventure. Just remember, there's a whole universe of opportunities out there. So thank you for watching VERSE.